Welcome to Star Wars Timeline. In today's video, I'm doing the review of the much talked about The Heart of the Jedi book. Stick around and find out if this is a true gem and how you can win a free copy of this book. Where should I start reading? What is canon versus legends? When does the story begin? The answers to these questions is right here on Star Wars Timeline. Hi, my name is Ben and I normally do Star Wars canon and legend book reviews. But today's video is a little bit different and I felt we need some context. This book was actually officially commissioned by Lucasfilm and Del Rey from uh, author Kenneth Flint. It was finished in 1993, but unfortunately it never saw the light of day. So we can't really call this book canon or legends. So what is it? It's a self-published book that the author was fortunate enough to release in 2015. Shout out to the StarWarsTimeline.net website, which published his work for free, where you guys can go and check it out. And just to let you know, I am not affiliated with that website in any way. Those guys did the job way before 2015, and that's when the story saw the light of day. And it's trending now because actually we saw some physical publication from Amazon.com, which lasted for a couple of weeks, and now it's gone. Now, let's jump in the story and find out what it's all about. And just to give you a time frame when this is supposed to happen, this story takes place immediately after episode six, literally a couple of days. So this is where the story would have taken place in the Legend Star Wars uh, timeline. Now, let's talk about the story. Spoiler alert. Before I get to my impressions of the book, I'm going to quickly run over the synopsis to tell you the story of what happens here. If you don't want to find out what it's all about, skip to the next section where I kind of give my overview and impressions of the book. And don't forget, guys, as you're watching this video, uh, a quick ad will pop up where you get the chance to win a free copy of this book at no cost to you. I'm basically shipping out 20 plus copies that I was able to secure for my fans to help me support and grow my channel. Now, let's get to the story. The first chapter opens up with a major accent scene where Luke Skywalker is leading the rebel troops versus the Imperials amidst their Imperial Star Destroyer ship. Um, obviously, he's victorious, he wins the day, but also learned that Luke is now a battle-worn, seasoned veteran, and uh, he needs to reestablish his identity, where he wants to go forward, and uh, how he needs to go about reestablishing the Jedi Order, and what his future holds. Um, so, uh, he's on a personal quest to find some answers, and the first thing that he does, he visits Kenobi's home. He kind of like gets a sense and aura of the thing. He reminisces on the past. And uh, Kenobi's spectral ghost actually appears to him and tells him that he needs to find the message and that you will be able to do it, Luke, because you're now a fully fledged uh, Jedi. Uh, Luke finds out that after uh, Kenobi's uh, homestead has been ransacked by Jawas and the Tusken Raiders, he needs to find this special object, this vase in which he believes the message is hidden. So he goes on a personal quest. He goes to the Tuscan encampments, he's being imprisoned by them, and then has to prove his worth as a seasoned warrior, but also as somebody who can respect the differences in their culture. And he earns their respect by defeating their champion. He's able to get uh, Kenobi's vase and learn the secrets uh, from it. So what he needs to do is basically find the heart of the Jedi, and there is no clear path laid out for him, he has to navigate it by his uh, uh, Jedi senses alone. Uh, we also learned a small little detail that he's being uh, shadowed by another unknown figure, uh, which also pursues him is in another X-Wing. Meanwhile, Han and Leia are on a diplomatic mission to secure peace with the Imperials. Uh, they pick up this another shrewd diplomat, a uh, young Prince Govan, um, who acts like Cinderella a little bit and he complains a lot. Um, and they're to follow to a secret location, which is known to very few parties, including Han Solo. Um, they travel to a smuggler moon uh, to meet with the Imperial Senator Validian, who is actually wants to negotiate peace with them and seize all fire on both parties. But there's another villain that comes into it, um, High Admiral Thrakus, who doesn't want any of it. Um, he has other ulterior motives, and he wants to secure... Uh, the Jedi power for himself because he learns of the Luke and how he had destroyed the second Death Star and he believes that actively following on the Force and learning all his things they can weaponize it just like the Death Star something like it so what he does is he charges with his Imperial fleet 
and he decimates the pirate moon. He kills all the Imperial senators, um, and he's after Han and Leia and Luke as well. We also learn that Tharkas has ambitions to uh, tame the Force and has it as his own, and the ambitions of becoming the next emperor. In the meantime, Luke Skywalker uh, 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 tr uh, starts traveling, and he finds this Ewok Captain Thatch. It's a very interesting, very awkward little space-faring uh, Ewok uh, on his freighter. Um, and together they travel to the unknown regions in search of this mysterious planet, the heart of the Jedi. Um, they nearly escape some Imperial patrol where the Ewok, crafty as he is, is was able to lure him into a trap and destroy the Imperial ship. Along the way, you'll also encounter um, an interesting flotilla of refugees who flee the center of the galaxy from all this war and, and uh, 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 difficulties. And he, Luke finds their living ship, which flows through space, and it's surrounded by this pacifist flotilla of smaller ships, which is in the book is described almost like a school of fish. So they accept Luke. He goes uh, uh, to them, to their leader, and uh, he finds out that there are these pacifists who revere and worship the force but he doesn't find the answers that he needs he just gets the points to the next location but they tell him yes there is a such a planet and it's a forbidden place and anyone who goes there never comes back um we cut back to han and leia who try to follow in luke's tracks they follow him to the uh, uh tatooine and he, they find out how he was able to secure a different ship leave his uh, x-wing behind and starts traveling. They come into the debris of the destroyed Imperial scout ship, and they also find the uh, um, pacifists and their living organic ship, which was actually attacked by uh, Ad High Admiral uh, uh, Thrakus and his Imperial fleet, who are also on Luke's trail. We see Luke single-handedly finds his way to this planet called uh, Argaratha, where he believes the secret, the heart of the Jedi will be. It's a single desolate uh, island covered by sandy beaches and vegetation, and he's uh, assisted by uh, its local natives and aquatic sentient beings, which help him to find the actual temple, which is surrounded by this massive wall, and Luke tries to find the ways to unlock it. Suddenly, a very cool-looking imperial aquatic walker ship emerges from the shore, and uh, Thrakus descends and apprehends Luke with his uh, stormtroopers. Meantime, Luke Han and the uh, Validian, the imperial senator, also land on the planet and get assistance from the same sentient beings who uh, uh, put them on the boats and bring them closer to Luke. It is here we find out that the young princeling uh, diplomat uh, Govan, who traveled with him, is also another shapeshifter who, uh, and a brother to the shapeshifter who followed Luke to the planet and impersonated the uh, Ewok uh, uh, captain and was able to track Luke that way. So these are two shapeshifter twins. They also apprehend uh, Han and Leia, and uh, Validian, the senator, is murdered by Thrakus to, meet, to illustrate that he means uh, business. Han and Leia are being taken away uh, into the prison, into the holding cell in that uh, aquatic walker. Luke has no other option at the threat of his uh, friends being murdered. He actually takes, unlocks the uh, Jedi Temple with his force powers, and he leads Thrakus and the stormtroopers into its center, where we get this sort of Indiana Jones kind of like moment where Luke has to prove himself worthy by avoiding different traps. Uh, and Thrakus gets to the center of it where he sees this red glowing orb and he tries to secure it, which obviously kills Thrakus because he's not prepared, he's not force sensitive, and he's simply not ready for it. Han, Leia, and Chewie are able to escape their trap while Luke also emerges from the temple and they defeat the Imperials. And the story closes with Luke basically understanding that it was the journey that was important and not what he actually finds on the island. And they basically reseal the temple and leave it alone. And now Luke is um, on his journey understanding with more understanding and uh, that he needs to train the next generation of the Jedi and follow the, where the Force calls him to. Now let's talk about my impression of the story here, what I felt were its uh, uh, triumphs and shortcomings as well. I had the pleasure of interviewing Kenneth Flint, the author of this book, which you could also check out the video. I'll post the link down in the video description below. 
And I wanted to give you a little bit of context and uh, uh, history behind this book so you understand where my opinion is coming from. And the first thing is I want to say that, guys, don't compare this book to recent Star Wars content. Not even early Legends content um, like late 90s and 2000s because this book is one of the pioneering stories in Star Wars. And Kenneth Flint himself related to me that Bantham and even Lucasfilm didn't have a lot of material to work with and he had to invent a lot of things along the way. Also, um, I find it very interesting and important to mention to you guys that the book caters to a very specific audience. It understands the source material of what Star Wars is and it leans more into the space fantasy element of it rather than hardcore science fiction, which quite honestly Star Wars never was. Um, and now I want to get to some points where I felt the book truly succeeds in triumph. Uh, the first and foremost, I personally started reading Star Wars books in early 2000s, maybe late 90s. Books like Truce at Bakura and Course of, of, of Princess Leia and Admiral Thrawn trilogy. And the uh, Heart of the Jedi has that same vibe of the 80s and 90s science fiction. And it, it feels so fun and endearing to modern uh, audience that I think you guys will be able to enjoy it as much as I did. Um, the prose in the book is very straightforward and it has very vivid imagery. If you're looking for some kind of fancy and intricate uh, wording and stuff like that, you won't find it there. The, the author relies more on like straightforward descriptions, but the imagery is very captivating and it's very easy to picture and visualize all the scenery and all the action or the alien species that he's describing. Also, I absolutely adore Han, Luke, and Leia's uh, likenesses. I think Kenneth was able to capture them flawlessly from the movies, and the translation from film to the uh, book chapters is seamless. I would say it's probably my favorite thing about this book, especially Luke Skywalker, on whom everything depends, but it's, it's basically the story about him. Um, as I mentioned before also, um, the book understands its source material. And if you learn about Kenneth Flint, he, uh, uh, um, he was a scholar of, of uh, classical mythology, particularly Celtic mythology, and it shows in this book here. He uses those traditional motifs, uh, which I, I also personally enjoyed. Um, also, in my interview with Kenneth Flint, he said that he wanted to tackle the story from Luke's perspective and he said, well, look, this kid went through the original trilogy, and as a 19-year-old, he experienced a lot of trauma, you know, in, in regards to his father, in regards to losing his aunt and uh, uncle. And what happens to him immediately after episode six? You know, what does he decide to do? You know, he, for a Jedi who's supposed to be a peace-loving uh, 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 person, he, he saw a lot of bloodshed and war. And how does he evolve and grow from it? And the book also was able to capture that as well, of Luke asking these tough questions. Um, I absolutely loved Luke's interaction with the Tuscan Raiders. Not only it showed the differences of two different cultures, but it humanized the Tuscans in a very interesting way and almost gave us that look into them, not as just like these props that, you know, stand somewhere in, in the screen or attack Luke or just shoot, take a few shots at Anakin Skywalker's pod race, but they're a tribe and a culture, and they have their own set of laws, and they respect strength, for example, that Luke is able to demonstrate and win the day. So that was also, I, I would say, the highlight of the book. I, I would say that I absolutely loved the first half of the book more than the second one because of the Tuscan Raiders, and I, I couldn't, I wish there was more of them. Um, also, it was fun to see Han and Leia's bickering, how they're still this lovey-dovey couple, but they still are figuring their relationship along the way. They're obviously not quite married yet. It takes place immediately after episode six. So they're figuring out the, so to say, moves to this dance, how, how they're going to proceed as a couple later on. Um, also, the book has very great built-up and mounting tension throughout the story, and then it culminates in a climatic scene at the end, which I saw, I, I thought was quite rewarding. Um, the plot twist in the book, you kind of, it's hinted every step of the way that Luke is being shadowed by this shapeshifter. He changes into one form, then he changes into the Ewok. And I honestly, for a person who reads a lot of literature outside of Star Wars, I saw it from a while away. I said, ah, you know, I, I know where this is going. 
but then when the second shape shifter suddenly came out and um the young prince diplomat kind of like points a gun and and han and leah and says you know that's it it's the end of the road for you that took me by surprise i was like oh okay so the author was able to keep that surprise in there and i thought there was going to be only one shapeshifter but then there was another one i thought that was uh, effectively executed and then interestingly enough once again guys this book was meant to be released in 1993 which took a year to write and let's go back to 1992 when the author was actually writing it. There are elements in this book which we see later on in Star Wars franchise in the Expanded Universe. And it makes me wonder, did those future authors kind of like took notes or ideas from this book? And just to list a few, for example, the living ship that Luke uh, uh, comes upon and he finds all these pacifists, it has those crazy Yozong Vong vibes to them so those of you guys who read the the installments of the expanded universe like the new jedi order you know the legacy of the force all those books and we learn about these interstellar intergalactic invaders who have this living equipment including ships uh, th this living ship from this book kind of harkened back to it um also in the uh the last jedi we see luke in this hermiting in this uh, abandoned island in the in the aquatic planet and also here, we see the very first Jedi Temple on a small island, which shrouded in mystery and, you know, in secrets, and it's very hard to find. I was like, oh, wow, interesting. And made me wonder, does The Last Jedi, when they were writing the script for the movie, was somehow this book sourced or looked into? Because even though it was never published, who knows, maybe it's still sitting there as a reference material for, you know, Star Wars authors. And the last but not least, I really loved Kenneth Flint's homage to the indiana jones movie the the last crusade where if you remember by the end of the film indy has to save his wounded father and pass this set of trials and traps and and prove himself worthy same uh, thing happens here in this book i felt it was very deliberate it's a small nod where uh, luke skywalker has to step into the seeming void and then they find that it was only an illusion and he was able to proceed i thought it was absolutely well done and i really enjoyed it now let's talk about the shortcomings of this book. Obviously, no story is flawless, and there was just minor few things that I wanted to mention and then give my overall score here. Um, Thracus, the imperial uh, 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 general, the, the the high admiral, who uh, uh, supposed to be the main villain of this book, I felt he was very bare bones. He's very cardboard. Yes, we do understand his motivations that he believes that this mystical power of the Force has some kind of military value and what he wants to you know grasp hold of it and becomes the next emperor but beyond that there is no personal stake there is no personal look at his problem of what he wants to accomplish there's no personality going on there he's a very straightforward villain maybe if you guys disagree with me you could drop a note you know in the video description in the video below and let me know how you felt about him for me he was barely functional he wasn't very interesting. I was like, oh my God, you know, he, you know, he did pose a threat though. So, so I would say that much. Also, I mentioned that I enjoyed Han and Leia's bear carrying and then their the lovely, you know, affair proceeding and, and uh, Han's uh, snarky remarks. But there were a couple of elements there which didn't quite work for me, not because they weren't well done, but because we already saw them in episode five. If you observe Han and Leia's dynamic in episode five and how it evolves in episode six, Return of the Jedi, where they have both grown as individuals and as a couple and they're past certain things. Well, the author comes back to it and there's a little bit of episode five stuff going on, on there where there's like a love interest in between them and they're not sure where they stand. I don't know, maybe it's valid, but that's the way I took it. That small little part of their relationship, which I felt was already done before. Um, and the last thing I want to mention is, guys, I don't care who writes a book, whether it's Timothy Zahn or Claudia Gray or any professional author, any manuscript demands professional editing. And unfortunately, because this book never saw the light of day, uh, my understanding is that it was edited by another author, but to which capacity, we don't know. There's a full story that you could read on StarWarsTimeline.net uh, of how this book got edited. But um, I could personally tell it suffered a little bit in that department. There's a couple of grammatical errors and things like that. But it's really a non-issue point that I just wanted to bring. It doesn't hinder the enjoyment of the book in any way.
So my final thoughts, if I were to score this book, and I'm coming from a mindset of a person who for a second puts all the material that I've read past this book, you know, the Thrawn trilogy, the, the Jedi Academy trilogy, and so forth. On its own, I would say that the book doesn't quite reinvent the wheel, but so what? You know, sometimes you don't need to introduce something entirely new to be enjoyable. So what the book tries to accomplish, it accomplishes quite well. It succeeds. And at the same time, it was nothing groundbreaking. Um, I enjoyed it. I thought it, I had quite good time with it. And I think the fans should absolutely re read it and enjoy it. I would give this book somewhere from 3 to 3.5. I'll stick to 3.5 because I can't be fully impartial. Uh, the story behind this book and how it was made and my interaction with Kenneth Flint kind of like grew my appreciation for it. But on its own merits, probably a 3. It's a decent book. It's pretty well written, you know, but it's not something out of this world. Uh, I could name a, a number of books which I felt was better. But once again, it's not fair to compare it to anything that came after it. Because I want to remind everybody that Kenneth Flint and the Heart of the Jedi is a pioneer to future Star Wars authors in many, many ways. And I think that's the most important takeaway from it. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Enjoy my review and thoughts. Um, as always, thank you so much for watching and supporting my channel. If you liked it, please like and subscribe. And I would love to have a discussion with all of you and hear how you guys felt about this book. You know, what you thought of the main villain? What did you think of Luke's uh, personal growth and so forth? And I will see you next time. Take care.